1.7 trillion of the 54 trillion, which is about 10% uh, of GDP, but they represent 52% of the population. It's mainly India, China, right? If you look at Latin America, 8.6% of the world's population, but only 6.3% of GDP. If you look at Eastern Europe, if you look at the Middle East, but then finally look at Africa. <coughs> one out of eight people live in Africa. They get one fiftieth of what we produce. So look at the two numbers, the two rows in red. The advanced economies, 15% of the population, slightly more population than Africa, but they have 72% of total output versus 2% for Africa. Now, I study this all the time, but until I put these numbers down, you, I just could not fathom what this all means. Finally, let's take a look at others. GDP per head, now we're controlling for population. When we looked at the old numbers, it was regardless of population. The highest is Luxembourg, not the United States, about $87,000 in output per person in Luxembourg. Norway is number two. The United States is number nine at $43,000. Germany is number 24. Burundi, is, num is the poorest, where Luxembourg, on average, people can share $87,000 in output. In Burundi, $120 per year. Congo, $140. So who are the biggest exporters in the world? Where do the exports come from? Anybody want to take a guess as to the largest exporting country in 2006? China. 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 It was actually the whole Euro-Asia area. It's the, e, the EC, the European Common Market. Represents one out of six dollars of all world exports, the European Common Market. The United States represents about one out of eight dollars of exports, followed by China, which is now much larger than that, followed by India. But again, if you look at just the European Union and the United States, you're talking about considerably more than a quarter of all the world's exports. Largest producers of oil in thousands of barrels per day. Anybody? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia? You nailed it. Canada. What's number two? <laughs> Russia. That's their power. It's oil. The United States is third followed by Iran, followed by China, followed by Mexico, followed by Canada. This is in the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. That's owned by Mexico. There's Canada. Somebody said Canada, Canada's in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. United Arab Republics, Venezuela, and Norway. Little country of Norway has half the population of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it has oil, which is equal to more than 40% of the United States with a population of 307 million. Who uses oil? There's the US, China, again, this is a little out of date. Japan, Russia, Germany, India, South Korea, Canada, Brazil. Finally, let's take a look at innovation. Where is innovation taking place in the world? And this is based on a measure that the economist has put together on the adoption of new technology. I think a good way to think about this is where are we most using computers, cell phones, all this new technology. Well, we're number one. Our index is the highest at 5.77. Switzerland is right up there with us, followed by Finland, Japan, 
Israel, Sweden, Germany, and South Korea. So if you think real hard about the cutting edge, the biotechs, the nanotechs, where are the new ideas being generated? You'll see that the index for these countries are almost identical. Those are our major competitors. If we think we're leading the world in innovation, these are the countries that we're competing with in that, along that metric. How about total expenditures on research and development? That is, what percentage of our total GDP is spent on R&D by private firms and the public sector together? What country do you think does that more than any other? <clears throat> the United States? Israel? You nailed it. Israel spends about 4.7% of its GDP on R&D. That means out one out of $20 is being spent on that. Sweden is number two. Finland is number three. Japan is number four. Who do you think is number five? South Korea. Switzerland. Iceland, the United States, is below all the other countries in terms of R&D. Then we can look at the biggest economies uh, by country and company. So let's look at, for example, the 23rd largest economy in the world. There are 160 countries. Walmart, the company, had sales of $351 billion in 2008. It was larger than Saudi Arabia. One country larger than the country with the largest oil reserves on Earth. It was followed by ExxonMobil, which was number 25, which was larger than Austria which was followed by Royal Dutch Shell, which was larger than Denmark. Gives you an idea about the concentration of business. And then followed by BP, the old British Petroleum. So let's talk about defense spending. I think this is another one of those softball questions. The United States in 2006 spent $536 billion on defense. Who was number two? China? Korea, Russia? Russia? It was China spending $122 billion, or roughly a fourth of what the United States does. So the country spending the second most on defense was spending less than a quarter of what the first country was, us. Here's Russia. We were spending, you know, <coughs> about eight times as much as Russia. Here's the United Kingdom, we're spending almost nine times as much as the United Kingdom, nine times as much as France, 14 times as much as Japan, 15, 16 times more than Germany, and about 20 times more than Italy. So if you add that all up, you'll see that the United States represents more than half the all of the defense spending in the world, in one country. Number of cars per 1,000 population. What country do you think has the most cars? <laughs> You're wrong. It's Luxembourg. 647 cars per 1,000, right? Population. This includes kids. The United States is number 16. That blew me away coming from Detroit. South Korea is number 46 at 230. The lowest, Bangladesh, one car per thousand population. Burundi, Central African Republic. 647 in Luxembourg, one in Bangladesh per thousand. Which is the busiest airport in the world measured in millions of passengers? Chicago O'Hare, London Heathrow, New York. JFK in New York, 
Frankfurt, Germany. It's Atlanta. It's gateway to the, all of Latin America. 89.4 million passengers went through Hartsfield, uh, which is their international airport in 07. Number two is O'Hare. Core, you know, the hub of the Midwest. This is not this is not in the United States. This is the busiest airports in the world. So we got number one, we got number two, London's number three, Tokyo, Haneda is number four. Then we got LA International, Gateway to the Pacific, Dallas, Fort Worth, Paris, Duval, Frankfurt, good call, and Beijing. What country have more tourist visits in 2006 than any other? Paris. Good, you saw the Eiffel Tower. That's really good. <laughs> good work. I use this with fifth graders and first graders, and it works. That's number two. Gay Paris, Spain. Coming up fast. Mainly because of the you know the wonders of Madrid, Barcelona, Bilbao, and of course southern Spain. Yeah. It was also much cheaper to visit there than most everywhere else. The United States actually gets fewer tourists than Spain. China right behind us in 2006, and I wouldn't be surprised if they don't eclip eclip eclipse us now. Italy, well, I, my favorite. The United Kingdom. The United Kingdom actually gets you know. Many less than half of what France does. There's Germany and Mexico. And now, <laughs> what country India. goes to the movies more than any other country? India. Look at the pictures, folks. <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> Australia. The United States is number three, Iceland is number four, Mexico is number 22, India is number 29, and Japan is number 32. It says something about culture and how culture spreads. So our friends down under are more likely to be looking at an American film than anyone else. And then finally, the internet. Which country hosts more internet websites than anyone else? China. By far. 291 million websites. Now let me remind you, there are only 307 million people. <laughs> right? That means one website per person, even though many of these people are under the age of six months old. <laughs> Japan is number two. But it has, you know, it hosts, you know, like one eighth the number of websites. Followed by Germany, followed by Italy. But you can again, again, get to see, you know, in an information age, where does power lie? One presumes that, in terms of the ability to move information, websites are important. The ability to make your culture dominant has something to do with films are shown and so forth. And so that is what we have in terms of taking just an overview of what this global economy looks like. And I thought, you know, damn, I'm an economist, I deal with numbers. It might be an important way to at least start this semester or at the very beginning, near the beginning of the semester, take a look at these numbers, which I hope you will see as a way, one lens of looking at the world. All of these, by the way, are up on our website, which you know well, I think by now, www.policyschool.neu.edu. So you can stump your friends with great <laughs> trivia questions about all of this. Without further ado, I want to now turn this over to my friend Bob Culver, uh, who I think, independent of what I was doing in preparing this class, also thought a lot about the model. Uh, I have a new bumper sticker that replaced my Deval Patrick sticker, and on top of that was the Obama sticker, and on top of that was the 
what's her name sticker? And then my new bumper sticker is called Demography is Destiny. Bob Culver, an overview of the global economy. I think actually what I am going to do, but first I'm curious, how, how many people have been coming to this class since we started it last year? Is there anyone here for the, wow, it's great, it's great. For those of you, therefore, who have been, and recall me as the curmudgeonly old CFO who comes forward to talk about these things, I, what I want to do, because I think it's, we're, we're going to break around seven. Well, so, a little after seven. Yeah, but let's, but for what, um, rather than going through this, the, the slides, what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes is sort of pause it, take what Barry has done. He loves this stuff. I mean, I knew when he saw this, he was going to take you through all this. And the test is how many of you can remember six things? <laughs> but, but really, the, the, the question is what is the question? that all this data raises as relates to our current global economy. What is the question? What is the question? Now, in, when, when data like this was first being presented, understood, certainly not as robustly or in such a timely fashion as we can now get it was probably back in the days of Malthus when, when folks were starting to realize that they ought to start thinking about population growth, they ought to start thinking about economies, and, and, and this data was meaningful because why? Because you had growing mercantile societies, predominantly the European societies, Spain, <coughs> Great Britain, and the Dutch. Were, were moving out from their countries and around the world and were seeking to make something called money. Um, and money was being invented, trade was being invented, and people were kind of interested in how this could be done optimally. Um, and, and therefore, they wanted to know things about the number of people there were, about, about the way the world worked. And, and this, this data was ultimately being collected, why? Because they had begun to understand something that in the last century became called what? Markets. Now, the issue was, how did you think about it? If you were someone who was dealing, if you were in Boston you know, 300 years ago, and you had an accumulation of capital, how did you think about its distribution? Well, the notion became one of who, who knows the definition of a market? Yes? Uh, it is a place where buyers and sellers come together to exchange whatever. You think the that's good? I think the classic definition of a market has to do with the distribution of scarce resources by and between competing entities with imperfect information. And that is, that is the classic Paul Samuelson Economics 101. That's where, that's where you start. Now, in light of all of this data, um, you ask yourself the question, what's the problem? Is this just fun data, or does this represent a challenge or a problem for us? And I would suggest that we do believe and have believed that, in fact, the issue of maldistribution, whether it is of populations or food or sources of energy, has been a problem in the world. How many people would agree with that? Now, <clears throat> that, how many people would agree who raised or didn't raise your hands, that your response is not an economic response, it's not a financial response, but it is a response of values. Well, the same number didn't raise their hands. Are, 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 are there, there are folks here 
after we go for a break, I would like to see someone sustain the argument that, that to suggest that the maldistribution of goods and services around the world that's showing concern for that is not a values proposition. I think most people believe it is a values proposition. Um, because if you don't, then what you are saying is, what is wrong with the maldistribution of goods and services around the world? You are saying, so what? You are saying there will always be haves and have-nots. Now, back to two, three hundred years ago. The, the, the basically uh, guilt-ridden sort of Judeo-Christian European culture at the time did think that maldistribution was an issue. Uh, they were concerned with how you got to notions of equal distribution, and therefore they started this idea that, aha, markets are a reasonable way to think about the distribution of goods and services. And trade will be the vehicle for taking maldistributed goods and services from areas to areas to, in fact, balance out wealth around the world. Now, of course, there were politics involved in all of this, and, and some people wanted more power than wealth, and so many books got written and many people talked about the distribution of wealth and power around the world. But basically, there was a mechanism in place for the longest time that said, we are going to focus on the distribution of scarce resources by and be between competing entities, basically called nation states, with imperfect information. So the leaders of the states will pay a lot of information to gather, uh, a lot of money to gather information from all over. As a result, kings, queens, everybody else are funding Christopher Columbus, they're funding, you know, Chinese uh, trading mission, they're funding all sorts of things to gather information. So that, in fact, they can trade, and so that, in fact, they can redistribute scarce resources by and between competing entities. But what else did they want to do in this notion of markets? What else was it that they wanted to do? They did want to accumulate wealth. And therein developed the problem that we really are confronting today. And that is, while it was believed that the notion of markets and having an economy based upon markets, and yes, I will get to Marxism and I will get to Russia in just a second, <clears throat> but it was believed that, that having a system based upon markets and the redistribution of goods and services by between competing entities was fine. It was also quietly acknowledged that this would result in the accumulation of wealth. And so actually, what came first was this notion of markets and mercantilism. And then kind of, you know, in the, in the mid-1800s, kind of after, in our time period, after the Civil War, you really had this notion of capitalism coming about. That is, the deployment of capital to, in fact, develop wealth. Okay? So not only would you trade, not only would you get in your ships and travel around and trade and collect information, and, and, and therefore rely upon markets for the redistribution of goods and services and the accumulation of wealth. But you would also begin to accumulate what would be called capital, and you would deploy capital, and you would earn a return on that capital. Not necessarily the sugar, the salt, the molasses, the sorghum, whatever it was you were trading, but in fact the capital itself. And so we had the development of a society which was a market-driven capitalist society where you could make money selling goods and services, food, energy, and the like, but you could also make money selling money so that it could be deployed, and you would get a return on your money, capitalism. Now, the, the, the problem that we now have is that we end up ha still having maldistribution. And I think what Barry's charts really demonstrate is that as we have moved forward 
And, and in, in my life, I, I had the great occasion to go to the London School of Economics and also to Harvard's graduate student and study some economics. And you know, it's all about markets. Markets, markets. They're going to cure the, the, the ills of the world. Well, they haven't. 